don't try to be like these TV and internet chefs that you see going all crazy with it. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not, it's not necessary. It's just a flex and it's not even a good flex. Hi, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Marta and I am the chef and author of Sense and Edibility, a site where I teach you everything I know about cooking, baking, and cocktail making. But in today's video, I'm not going to teach you anything about cooking, baking, or cocktail making. Instead, I'm gonna teach you everything I know about knives. <sighs> knives are the most important tool in a kitchen. And if you have a bad knife, you probably know you have a bad knife because you have a lot of cuts. If you have a good knife, you know it is something that you probably can't work without in the kitchen. A sharp knife is safe. A sharp knife is efficient, which means you get your work done faster. And a sharp knife takes a lot of the frustration out of preparing meals, especially if you're like me. You, I make a salad with almost every meal. And tomatoes, they are the, the snitches in the kitchen. They will tell on you if your knife is not sharp enough. So I want to teach you everything that I know from start to finish about knives. But before we get into the video, I would love it if you would click subscribe to my channel so that I can continue to produce these videos and bring them to you and educate you on all things culinary. All right, so let's get into the video. Next to a knife, the most important thing you need in your kitchen is a honing steel. A honing steel is basically a steel rod. Sometimes you can get them in ceramic, glass, um, diamond impregnated. You can get them in those different materials and then they come in different textures. So you can get it coarse, medium, or fine grain. And this is just used to keep that edge nice and straight and refined or as sharp as it can be. If it's not sharp, it won't stay sharp and honing it won't make it sharp. This is a six inch utility knife. Utility knives across the board, regardless of what they are labeled as, whether they're chef's knives or serrated knives, they're used for lightweight chores. So mincing herbs or chopping garlic, something lightweight. Um, this is actually a Japanese knife, so it's lighter in the hands than German knives. This is a six inch chef's knife. One thing I tell people is though the design on this blade looks really cool, that's not what you want to focus on. You want to focus on a blade that is going to accomplish what you need it to accomplish. In this case, a chef's knife is a little heavier than a utility knife. And the reason why this one is heavier is because it has a full tang. So if you look at the handles, you'll see that this metal piece of metal is one, one long piece of metal, right? So the tang is what runs through the handle and it's held in place by rivets. If your tang is as almost as long as your blade, it's a full tang. Here you have, it's a partial tang or it may be even a rat's tail tang. So it's not the full length of the blade, but it is inserted into the handle and it is attached to the handle by that bolster, which is the bulky metal part right above the handle. Um, I like this blade because it's a Japanese blade again, and it's lightweight, so it doesn't wear my arm out too much when I'm using it. This is a three and a quarter inch paring knife. Paring knives are used for small, fine detailed stuff like hulling strawberries or peeling an apple or removing stems or seeds from a jalapeno pepper. It's grippable right at the bolster and it's just, it's just more convenient to use when you're doing small tasks. This is a six and a quarter inch flexible boning knife. This is what you would use if you want to fillet fish or if you want to remove meat from a bone. This one has, it, it's called a flexible boning knife because it's flexible and that helps you get around bones in meat or fish or poultry. You don't want to use this for something like if you have to butcher a chicken. It's, it, it's, it's not made to do that because it's too flexible and it's going to move around too much on you. Now this is another version of a boning knife. It isn't as flexible as the one, as the silver one. It still has some bend to it, but you can see the difference between the two. The one in my right hand I would use for more sturdier, firmer flesh. 
this is also this is a filleting knife which is doggone near a boning knife it's the same thing but it's, it has no flexibility at all so i would use this for something like removing pork from ribs this is a carving or a slicing knife. You would use this to carve roast beef or standing rib roast, something where you want nice, precise slices, but you don't need the flexibility of a boning knife. Those little dents help the meat, keep the meat from sticking to the blade. This is a meat cleaver or a butcher's knife. It is extremely thick, very heavy in the hand. This, it has a full tang, which all meat cleavers should have because you need it to be very sturdy to cut through those bones. That's what a meat cleaver is used for, to cut through bones. This hole also allows you to hang it from a peg, which I don't do because what if a psycho horror killer comes into my house and uses that to kill me? This is a nakiri or a vegetable cleaver, which I mean, I only bought because it looks pretty. Um, you would use this for like chopping carrots or something like that, but this is also, you can also use a chef's knife to do this. This is really a novelty knife. This is a utility serrated knife. This you would use, this is a great tomato slicer, to be quite honest. Most serrated knives are great for slicing tomatoes. This is an offset bread knife or a serrated knife. You can use this to slice uh, bread, fresh bread or homemade bread. Uh, you can also use this to slice um, tomatoes or cakes. The teeth help go through it, go through whatever you're slicing without tearing it. This is a larger nine inch. No, this is, yeah, that's a nine inch bread knife. It also has serrated, uh, a serrated blade to get you through bread or cake without tearing it. This is a larger 14 inch bread knife or a cake knife. This is a, a knife that I used to use to cut my large big event cakes when I was a cake decorator. It's wide enough so that you can go through a 12 inch cake. This is a scimitar, which is a type of meat cleaver. This allows you to butcher larger pieces of beef. Like if you have beef quarters for some reason and you wanna butcher them, that is a great tool to have. This is a flat edged paring knife. This is a specialty knife. You probably wouldn't need this. I think the only reason why I actually have this is because it came in my kit. This definitely is a specialty knife. This is a tournée knife. This is used to do garnishes like you would see on those fancy buffets at Easter time at the country club, which I've never been into a country club. And the kitchen shears. Kitchen shears are amazing. They have so many different things. That's a nutcracker, or you can use that to open up bottles. You can put your finger in it. On the edge, it has flat, it's almost like a flathead screwdriver. So you can use that to um, adjust the head on your stand mixer or pop open a bottle or whatever you want to use it for. And of course, they come apart. There's a little hook right above the handle that you can use to kind of pop open bottles too. Most kitchen shears, if they're good quality, will come apart to make cleaning easier. You can use kitchen shears to cut the back out of a chicken, um, to, to cut a lot of things, quite honestly. But I recommend buying those that come apart so you can wash them thoroughly. Okay, now to maintain your knives. This is a blade guard which is used to give your knife the proper degree. You always need to sharpen your knives at a 20 degree angle your knife blade and what this does is it slides onto the back of your knife and you can use it to make sure you're getting that right angle i have been sharpening my knife so long i no longer use it but i'll show you how to use it this is my sharpening stone it has two different grits a thousand grit and a six thousand grit a thousand grit is the coarser you would always want to start with a thousand and the six thousand is a fine grit it also comes with a wooden base. It has a non-slip bottom to keep it from sliding around. And it also has a rubber bracket that you would put on the bottom or whatever grit you're not using, nestle it into that wooden carriage, and it keeps it from jostling around inside the wooden block. Now, before you go to use a whetstone, you have to soak it in water. That's the reason why it's called a whetstone, I believe. 
you'll notice it starts bubbling as soon as you put it into the water because it's being um it's absorbing that water to keep your knife from becoming too hot while you sharpen it friction is caused when you rub two things against the other if you're rubbing metal against stone it's going to create friction and if you don't have anything to lubricate the knife you're going to scratch it and you may even tear chunks out of your knife's blade so i usually soak my whetstone for about 15 to 20 minutes I make sure that it feels nice and heavy. And then I just nestle it into its rubber footing. Keep the bucket of water nearby because you're going to want to add more water to the whetstone despite soaking it. This is the knife that my family uses. They don't always hone their edges, which really irritates me. So I just wanna show you how it's not cutting as well as I want it to. There's resistance. A tomato is a surefire way to find out if your knife is dull or not. If you can't get through a tomato or a grape, you need to sharpen it. So before I sharpen it, even though I soaked it, I'm gonna add some water to my 1000 grit, the coarser side of my stone. You're gonna take it from the heel, which is the wider part of the knife, and run it down to the tip of the knife. Both sides, you want to apply the same pressure and count it as one. It should only take about 10 passes total, so 10 on each side, to get that first part going. You'll notice when you start seeing the, um, the soot or the burrs, on the stone or on the knife that it's it's getting sharpened you'll do the same thing on the white side so 10 times on each side and then what you want to do is allow your whetstone to dry out completely before you store it check check your knife to make sure there's no dents or pits or anything like that and then you want to grab your honing steel because now it's time to refine that edge get it really nice and straight let me grab my grape now you can see now you can, <laughs> I'll get it together. And now instead of meeting resistance, like when I attempted to slice the grape before, it is slicing like butter through the grape skin, through the flesh. Here's a different angle so you can see how efficiently it's slicing. And this is the benefit of having sharp knives always. Now that we have gone over all the types of knives that exist, I won't say all of the knives. I have most of the knives that you will ever need in the kitchen, unless you're doing something really fancy like garmache or you're doing um you know carvings out of fruits and stuff i mean i don't do that anymore and what i do cut for parties and such i can do it with a paring knife that doesn't mean that you need all of these knives in fact i tell people that you only need you only technically need three types of knives and that's even a stretch um you definitely need a chef's knife this knife is used for cutting, dicing, slicing, julienning, taking apart stuff. Like in my chicken video, I used only a chef's knife to take apart my chicken. For the most part, a chef's knife is all you really, really need. The other knife that I recommend people have is a paring knife. A paring knife does, the, does small jobs that a chef's knife, chef's knife is too big to do. Paring knife and a chef's knife, these are the two that are essential in the kitchen. Every knife has the same components. A blade, this part, a blade. The bolster, which is where the blade and the handle attach. This is the handle. And the tang, the tang runs through the length of the handle or go, for the most part, into most of the handle. Um, usually if you see this on the end, you know that your tang went all the way through. Sometimes that's not accurate. Um, some knives, like this chef's knife, have uh, the, the, the tang of the knife running all the way through where you can see it, and it's attached to the handle by rivets. Uh, yeah, rivets, here. <laughs> so these rivets should always be flush with the knife handle, which is, you know, this is a quality knife because it actually is flush with the handle even though the handle is not a straight uh, it doesn't have straight sides. It kind of bevels in where you would grip it. So the tang, again, is still a part of the blade. This is one piece of steel, and it runs down the length of the handle. This makes for a sturdier blade, which makes a sturdier knife, which means the knife will last longer. So the tang is just the continuation of the blade. It runs from the tip down to the very bottom of this uh, handle, right? held in place into the handle with rivets. The bolster is where the knife blade and the handle meet. That's also where you would grip the knife. And this is the blade. 
this is not this this blade does not have a full tang i can feel it because the handle is it feels hollow it feels light and that's okay because this is a very specialized knife it's only used for certain things this is not used for chopping stuff this is not used for breaking apart bones this is used to re remove soft flesh from bones right i don't come in contact with if i'm coming in contact with bones with this knife i'm doing something wrong whereas this knife is made to break apart bones to go through bones so you see it has a full tang has rivets and it's a heavy knife it's a heavy blade it's a very thick blade when you compare it to this right so this is what you want you want to buy the knife that is made for what you need to do you're not going to use a paring knife to cut up chicken bones there are carbon steel blades stainless steel blades high carbon blades Carbon steel it can take on a better edge than many other metals, and they also lose that edge really fast. So you really have to be dedicated to sharpening your knives or getting your knives sharpened on a consistent and re fairly regular basis when you're using carbon steel. I prefer stainless steel for all my knives blades because they hold a better edge for a longer time. They also don't rust, they don't pit, they don't do a lot of the things that carbon steel would do or cheaper metals would do. But the issue with stainless steel is like in most situations where if it holds an edge longer, it takes a little while to get that edge. It takes more effort to sharpen your knives, but it holds that edge, that knife edge really, really long if you maintain your knives. For me, using stainless steel is a no brainer because I sharpen my knives quarterly or I take them out to get sharpened. So if you're going to opt for stainless steel, you want to make sure that you're getting them sharpened professionally or you're doing a good job of sharpening them yourselves, which I showed you in the video, to, to maintain that edge. And you always wanna make sure you're refining that edge with a, a honing steel in between sharpenings. There's also um, knives made of high carbon stainless steel, which kind of fuses carbon steel and stainless steel together gives it it's easier to sharpen but it holds the edge longer so that's another option so those are the different metals that your knife could be made of if you take care of your knives they will last a lifetime that's what they're made to do if you're buying ceramic knives or knives that are made of low quality metals they're not going to last forever but if you invest in your knives i mean and i'm not talking you have to buy a super expensive knife but if you buy a good quality knife and take care of it it will last you a lifetime my oldest knife is about 30 years old so and that's young so <laughs> i'm i'm just gonna touch on minor they're not minor details but they are kind of minor the material that your knife handle is made of is also important so rosewood or a type of hardwood is ideal for your handle Plastics are okay that like, again, this is used for a very specific purpose. It could crack, it could break, it could melt, it, it has melted. I have plenty of nice handles that were made of plastic materials that have melted. So wood is ideal. The bolster is very important because this is what attaches your knife to the handle. And if you have a cheaply made knife that is attached with, if it has a collar, around the handle that means that the knife is not inside the handle it means it's attached to that collar or it's just barely plugging into the handle it's going to fall apart that's why i don't recommend them so if you have a knife that has something like this like a collar i strongly encourage you to invest in a knife that just has a bolster like this even better like this because you can see where the tang is going so that means it's a quality knife that's going to stay together for a long time now i gave you a brief explanation of a sharpening stone this is not something that you need to have there are people out there whose whole life is dedicated to making your knives sharp and i strongly encourage you to support those businesses especially if they're small businesses because they know what they're doing they do it for a living and they're eager to do it this is something that i do quarterly and it is very therapeutic for me i love sharpening my knives i love making sure that <laughs> The edge is very, very sharp. But when purchasing a sharpening stone for your knives, you want one that has different grits. 
So mine has a thousand grit and a 6,000 grit. This is the finer grit. This is the coarser grit. You rarely, if ever, should need to use the coarser grit. If you went to an estate sale or you went to the thrift shop and you found a, an amazing knife, you probably want to use the 6,000 or the, the thousand grit to bring back the edge on that knife. Um, <laughs> my family doesn't take care of their knives the way I take care of my, my knives in the studio. Um, so I sometimes have to employ the thousand grit stone, but even when you're using the thousand grit stone, unless your knife is just like, you are outside digging in the dirt with it, you shouldn't need to run your knife over the thousand grit more than 10 times. If you, if you, yeah, if you need to do that, something's going on. But the 6,000 grit, the finer one, is what really refines that edge, really gives you that very sharp blade. It's very important when you are sharpening your knives to run it along the stone evenly, with even pressure from the heel of the knife to the tip of the knife. So you're running the length of the blade from heel to tip with even pressure at a 20 degree angle to refine the edge and you're doing it the same amount of times on both sides so if you do it on if you if you run your knife along the sharpening stone 10 times on this side you need to do the same thing on this side to create a nice straight sharp edge make sure when you're purchasing your sharpening stone, and of course I'm gonna to link to the one that I own but make sure you're purchasing one that has a non-stick bottom I don't, you don't have to use this. You can, you can even just do this. You can just put this on your surface and it won't move, but this helps to elevate the stone to make it easier for you to run the blade through or over. And it also is another added measure to keep the stone from sliding around. If you don't have that, you just want to buy the stone. You can do that and just put the stone on top of a damp kitchen top that's folded up. This is a blade guide. It keeps you from going too high up when you're sharpening or too far down when you're sharpening. You need to maintain a 20 degree angle when you're sharpening your knife blade. Some knives that are thicker and that have more of a cutting edge, like a butcher's knife, will require you to go a little bit higher, so about 30 degrees. Um, if you're going at a 45 degree angle, you're gonna mess up your blade. If you're going too low, you're not gonna do anything. You're just, you're actually gonna scrape or scratch your blade. If you go too high up like this, 45 degrees, then you're like, you're damaging your blade more than you're sharpening it. And of course, the steel. The steel is the other tool that I always tell people you absolutely, if you have knives, you should have a steel. And you should have decent steel because this is what's gonna keep your knife's edges refined sharpened okay it's going to maintain the sharp edge remember i said in my last video if you don't have a knife with a sharp edge a steel ain't going to do nothing but waste your time so whenever you are using a steel you don't need to go you do need to maintain a 20 degree angle okay you need to maintain a 20 degree angle but you don't need to apply a ton of pressure i see a lot of people like hacking at it and here's another thing i i tell my friends all the time don't try to be like these TV and internet chefs that you see going all crazy with it. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not, it's not necessary. It's just a flex and it's not even a good flex. Take your time. You're going to go from heel to tip and you're going to do it on both sides. You can do it like this. 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 I, I never do this, by the way. I never do it on my table. One, because with my MS and my dexterity issues, I've slipped more than once and ended up nicking my countertop. You can probably see it in some of my videos, actually. The other thing you want to listen for when you're refining your edge or using a steel is a ringing. You want it to go ping. If you hear, if it sounds like like that, you're, you're, you're rubbing it too hard against the steel. However, however many times you want to do it, you shouldn't need to do it a ton of times, more than 20, because if you need to do it more than 20, that means you don't have a sharp knife and you need to start back from square one, sharpen your knives. 
Make sure whenever you are sharpening your knives, you always have a lubrication of some sort. Friction means heat. Heat and friction on a stone means you are damaging your knife blade. So use water. That's why you soak your whetstone or mineral oil. I don't like to use mineral oil because over time it builds up and it becomes gunky and I have to do more maintenance to my stone or replace my stone more often and I don't want to do that because I'm frugal. Water works well. You just have to make sure you keep it lubricated. I really, I really, I really feel like I answered all of the frequently asked questions that I get about knives as I was explaining about knives. I will say that different people need different knives. We all should have a chef's knife. We all should have a paring knife. We all should have a steel, a honing steel. But what brand you buy, what country it comes from, all those are up to you. And it's very difficult for me to say that one size fits all because it doesn't. For example, I have I, I joke that I have man hands, like I have manlier hands than most women do. My husband says that I'm crazy. I am, but not because of that. But I, I feel like I have bulkier hands than most women do. So I prefer a knife with a handle that is, is, is hardy, you know, it's, um, this is, this is a great knife for me because it just, it makes sure that with my MS trimmers and sometimes like my dexterity is not there, my fine motor skills, I have something to grip onto. You won't really find safe pairing knives. You won't really find knives that don't have a nice sturdy handle, but you want to make sure that when you're going to shop for your knives, you're, you're, you're touching the knife that you will potentially buy. You want to make sure it feels good in your hand. Japanese knives are lighter weight than German knives. German knives are just sturdier, right? They're not, stu I won't say sturdier. They are more heavy duty. The blades are more heavy duty than Japanese, which are very fine and light, lightweight knives. In some cases, I need a heavier knife when I'm using a meat cleaver. Storage and care for your knives. It is so important. Just like sharpening and refining your edge on a regular basis is important, the way you wash and store your knives makes a difference in the lifetime of your knife. Please don't ever put your knife in a sink full of soapy water. That is the number one way that a lot of people end up cutting themselves in the kitchen is because they're hiding their knives under soapy water. You should never submerge your knife for an extended period of time in any type of water. That means don't put your knives in the dishwasher if you want them to last. Water dulls the blade, it pits the blade, it just is not, water and metal usually don't mix. It dulls the blade so much faster than if you hand wash them, dry them immediately, give them another run on the steel and put them in the storage block. Storage is important as well in protecting your knife's blade. You want to store your knife in a storage block. If you have one of those magnetic um, wall knife holder things or in a block that goes into your drawer, you don't want your knives all, you know, loose and willy nilly in your, your drawer because it's going to, every time that blade bumps up against something in the drawer, it, it dulls it even further. It could nick it, but it's also dangerous. If somebody that's not familiar with the way you store your knives reaches into that, that cabinet or that that drawer, they're gonna end up cutting themselves. And mm, that's just mm. how to behave with knives. Whenever you plan to pass your knife to someone else in the kitchen, if you cannot put it down on the, the countertop, you want to hand it to them with the handle towards them. So whoever's taking it, you wanna hand it to them like this. Make sure you're, you're not gripping the blade at all because you know what's gonna happen. But it's always recommended that if you're handing off a knife to someone to lay it on the countertop, lay it on your surface with the handle facing them so that they can grab it, right? Never put your knife down where the handle or the blade or any part of the knife is hanging off the edge of the countertop. That's something you just don't want to do in the kitchen with anything in general. You also always want to face the blade away from you, away from the edge of the, the countertop especially, but always away from you so that if you happen to move your hand for some reason, you're not gonna cut yourself on the blade. This is dangerous. 
This knife is sitting here like this. My knife is sitting on the counter like this. That's dangerous. We don't want to do that either. When you are walking, don't walk through the kitchen like this. Don't walk through it like this or like this or like this. Always walk with, with a knife with the blade down and facing away from your body. So the knife, the blade should be behind you, facing behind you. You should have it down by your side, close to your body. If you have a dog, make sure you watch for the dog. But when you're walking in the kitchen and you're, you know, behind somebody and you have a knife, you say sharp behind to let them know that not only are you behind them, but you have something sharp. So sharp behind is a way we call out to keep things safe in a commercial kitchen. If we're behind somebody with no sharp object, we just say behind to let somebody know that I am behind you. But if we have something sharp, we say sharp behind, or if we have something hot, we say hot behind, okay? If a knife falls, here's how you react to it. That's it, get out, get out of the way. Get out, don't be a hero. Don't be a hero, you don't have to catch a folding knife. You know the likelihood, look, look how much blade versus handle. There's a ratio here. The ratios, the odds are not in your favor that you're always gonna grab the handle. So, if a knife falls in your kitchen, jump out of the way. It's not worth cutting yourself, maybe needing stitches, or maybe it going through your foot. Move out of the way. Let the knife fall, it'll be okay. So those are my proper handling techniques for knives, I hope you pay attention and you start observing the ones that you aren't observing because I want you to stay safe. I am a proponent, advocate, promoter of wooden cutting boards. Wooden cutting boards are the best surfaces for you to use your knives on. Next is a composite material, so plastic. The HDPE, high density propylethylene, it's basically a hard plastic cutting board is the next best option. Marble, glass, stone, metal. Ooh, ooh. Not only do they make me cringe from the sound that it makes when a knife hits those materials, it's horrible for your knives because it dulls the blade faster, could nick them. So avoid those. And again, just storing your knives is of the utmost importance. Don't let your knives just like lay around where kids can get out, get at them, where dogs or cats can knock them down and hurt somebody, or don't leave them in a drawer just all loose and freewheeling out there. We don't wanna do that. I will link to my favorite knives and the knives that I own and use frequently in my comments section or in the description box below. Check those out. Check out my, the, the sharp, ah, I got something in my, oh my gosh. Oh, I got something in my. Check out the sharpening stone that I use. You can also check out the honing seal that I use. These are all the things that I own and use and stand by. If I didn't answer any question that you have about knives, feel free to drop them in the comments below. I will try to answer them um, to the best of my ability, but I think I covered most things that people would ask. I feel like I did. I'll do a lot more, this is what you should have, this is what I use, this is equipment in the kitchen that you should invest in videos because I think they're helpful. But yeah, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, sign up for notifications so that you can get notified every time I post a new video and I will see you on the next video. Don't forget to stick around for outtakes because I got a few of them. All right, bye. And in today's video, I'm not teaching you anything about cooking, baking, or cocktail making. I am teaching you everything I know about not. Kylo Ren, you gotta go my good boy. Go, you gotta go, mama's working. Okay, you can lay down there, but you gotta be quiet, okay? Be quiet, my good boy. Kylo, you're being too loud. Kylo Ren, you can't be in here, my good boy. Go lay down, and mama, will, I'll spend time with you later, okay? Can you go lay down? Can you go lay down, my good boy? Go lay down, good boy. That's a good boy. You're such a good boy. You're the best boy ever. Yes, you are. This is my little Bubba's. This is our new baby. His name is Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren, say hi. Say hi, Kylo. Yes. Say hi to... No, I'm not going to give you belly scratches right now. I'm working. I'm working, Kylo Ren. But I want you to say hi to my friends. Say hi, my good boy. Yes. You hanging out with Mama today. Yeah, okay, I'll give you some scratches. This is my good boy. You guys, look at my baby. Isn't he the cutest thing ever? Yes, this is Kylo Ren. Yes. I did uh, an, an analysis of my 
my YouTube channel and found out that 70% of you haven't subscribed to my channel. And that's kind of messed up because it's like you're coming into my house, you know, taking all my wisdom and knowledge and then bouncing. And that makes me sad. They're used for knives. They're used for applications. They're used. You hear that? I should not be doing that. That is not safe. Don't put it up to your face like that. Ooh, there's a squirrel outside. Squirrel. I feel, oh, oh, oh my God. I'm okay, am I okay? Oh, I got you, little bastard. Um, so 